This is The Speaking Show. I'm David Newman, and you're tuned in to the number one podcast for speakers, consultants, and experts who want to speak more profitably. I am here with Celeste Warren, Vice President of Global Diversity and Inclusion at Merck. Welcome. Great to have you on the show. Thank you for having me. Now, you first came across my radar because you are doing a panel at the Pennsylvania Conference for Women. Yes? I did. It was yeah. last week. How did that go? Well, it was fun. I was the MC. So this year, I was on a panel last year. It was fabulous. It was 11,000 persons in the Philadelphia Convention Center. It was packed. And it was just a very energetic, very engaged. Everyone was just upbeat. And it was really good. And I loved my subject because we were talking about engaging male allies in the quest to advance women. So a very important topic. Yeah, how about that? We'll circle back to that because I do want to tap in a little bit of your expertise in addition to what we're talking about with thought leadership and presenting your ideas and using speaking as an influence strategy, both internally and externally. Tell us a little bit about your professional journey because you've had quite the career. Take us back as far as you'd like and sort of what were the steps along the way that brought you to your professional adventure today? Well, it's an interesting story. When I was growing up, I wanted to be a sports reporter. That's all I wanted. I played sports in high school and in college. And when I graduated from the University of Kentucky, I started doing reporting, both news and sports, and um, just loved it. But it got to a point where, you know, 10% of the people make 90% of the money in that industry and 90% of the people make 10% of the money. I got tired of calling my parents and saying, hey, um, need money for rent or need money for this. And so I decided to go back to school. When I got to graduate school, my mom talked me into coming back home to the Pittsburgh area, Western PA is where I'm from. And so she talked me into coming back home, close to home. And I went to Carnegie Mellon University. And when I was going there, I originally wanted to take my reporting background, a minor in political science. And I wanted to take that and say, hey, you know, I'll move to Washington, D.C., be like a campaign manager. Seems fun. (laughs) And when I got to Carnegie Mellon, the guidance counselor there talked me out of it. She said, oh, my goodness, no, you don't want to do something like that. (laughs) She goes, what about human resources? And When I thought about human resources, my vision of it or my initial thought was this old woman with a bun in her head sitting there handing out applications. And I was like, I don't know if I want to do that. And she said, oh, no, it's much more than that. And she opened my eyes to the world of human resources. And I interviewed for an internship with uh, General Foods, the old General Foods company back in the day. I loved it. And it's been like hand to glove ever since then. So I've had various different roles. First, I was with Kraft General Foods for about eight or nine years and then came over to Merck and have been with Merck ever since and just different roles and different responsibilities, all in the human resources arena, but uh, different areas and our research, our commercial organization, our manufacturing organization over the last five years doing diversity and inclusion. That is a fantastic journey. And I'm curious, you know, along the way, I think this was maybe 10 or 15 years ago, Celeste, there was an article, a cover story actually, in Fast Company magazine that totally took on a life of its own. And you may remember this. The article was called Why We Hate HR. Mm. Do you remember that? I remember the article, yeah. And I think that author, it's one of these Fast Company columnists, he then went around the Sherm circuit. He went around the, obviously, you know, the Society for Human Resource Management, national events, global events state chapters, preaching. It's funny because the article was really in defense Mm -hmm. of the HR profession and the HR industry. And it was a little bit of a wake-up call that we have to stop being functionaries. We have to stop being the lady with the bun taking the Mm -hmm. applications. (laughs) And we have to start being strategic leaders. Yes. You know, the cliche, of course, in HR is that they want to earn a seat at the table. Yes. Well, you don't just get a seat at the table. He said, you have to earn your seat at the table. When you see meetings going on in this area and that area, you put yourself in that meeting. 
-hmm. When you see decisions being made about this topic or that topic, you give your input, even if you're not asked about those decisions. That's what a strategic leader does. That's what the CFO is going to do. That's what the chief marketing officer is going to do. That's what the chief technology officer is going to do. Why don't HR executives step up and do the same thing? Now, obviously, you know the playbook because you've achieved a very senior position in HR. What are some of the lessons learned along the way for other HR executives that might be listening to our conversation who are not getting the respect, they're not getting the attention, they're not getting the ear of the C-suite to push their initiatives through? How did you navigate that skillfully while adding value at every step? That article was a wake-up call for a lot of my HR colleagues. I can remember it being passed around (laughs) to all of my colleagues when it came out. And the reason why I liked it is because it was very true. We have to stop thinking about being an HR functional person and being a business leader. And that's what I think is really, really critical. Everyone is a business leader. It's just a matter of what is your spin? What is your niche? Ours would be in the people space. You have to be able to say, what value am I bringing to that business leader? And how I have done it in the past is I have to understand that leader's business. I have to understand it inside and out, almost as good as anyone else in the organization. My credibility depends on that. And so when I'm coming to the table and I'm talking to that business leader, I talk from a standpoint of understanding what keeps him or her up at night. And so when I know that, I know basically then how can I anticipate what his or her needs are going to be from a business perspective involving their people? Because I always say strategies, Excel spreadsheets, marketing strategies, those are all pieces of paper. It's people that implement those strategies. It's people that develop the software. It's people that develop and go into, in our business, go into the patients and interact with the physicians. Those are people. And so what is our strategic standpoint going to be in leading people to doing what we need the organization to do? And that's basically kind of how I like to phrase it and understanding it. And so I joke and say that I want to be there with the Kleenex when my line leader gets ready to sneeze. That's how you have to be. You have to anticipate the needs and be able to say what's trending, what's happening, and then being able to meet the needs and be able to mitigate risk and drive the business. Yeah, absolutely. Now, your role today, is that company-wide for diversity and inclusion, or are you within a certain business unit right now? It is global. It's enterprise-wide. Wow. Mm -hmm. So you got 69,000 people, 69,000 boxes of Kleenex. Yes. (laughs) That is super (laughs) impressive. How about that? That's a lot of Kleenex. There must be some big truck. It's like, oh, here comes the truck for Celeste. Back it up. Here we go. (laughs) The stock just went up in that brand. (laughs) I know. I know. That's incredible. So now at this point, and I love what you said about the wake up call and about being more savvy with the way that we present our ideas. Let's talk about internal thought leadership. Every senior leader, whether they use a speaking strategy out in the public or not, there is a influencing strategy, which is obviously through communication, the way we speak, the way we write, face-to-face, voice, Zoom, you know, we're communicating around the globe. What are some of your favorite strategies or insights around influencing people to think differently and to get behind your ideas so that your ideas and your initiatives have more energy to overcome any kind of resistance. I know you have a background in change management also, and obviously selling ideas and selling change is a very important factor there. How have you done that? And what two or three strategies are some of your favorites when you're looking to change hearts and minds internally to the organization? One is very important is the art of listening and understanding. When I go and I'm preparing to go into a meeting with a business leader around diversity and inclusion, sort of like a lawyer, you need to know what the answers are to the questions that you're going to ask. And that's basically kind of the best advice I can give to anyone, especially in my space. Because a lot of times, The heart is in a business setting. You try to approach that 
to help guide them. But sometimes the moral compass is whatever it is. So I try to approach it from the standpoint of the mind and the business as well. Because what I found is those who are already ambassadors for diversity and inclusion, the heart is already engaged for whatever reason, whatever it is that really sets them to really engage with diversity and inclusion, that's already there in the heart. My challenge is getting the mind of the others and helping them to understand the business benefit of diversity and inclusion. And I hate that phrase, what's the business case for diversity? I hate it. Ken Frazier, who's our CEO, always says, well, you tell me the business case for exclusion for non-diverse teams. Tell me what that business case is. And it's just so funny. He flips the coin. And it's very, very true. We need to understand as DNI practitioners what drives our business and how that works. So from my standpoint, our patient base, we live and die by our patient base. And if our patients are diverse, then our employee base needs to be just as diverse to make sure that we understand what's happening in the various different communities in the Latino and Hispanic community, in the African-American community, in communities across the globe in various different countries. If we don't understand that, what are those barriers to them making the health decisions that they need to make? Then we can't drive our business and we can't help patients to reach the optimal health outcomes that they're looking for. And so from my vantage point, making sure that we understand them. And that means that we have to have a diverse employee base. We have to have diverse employees of those various different backgrounds in the rooms when we're planning strategies, when we're planning marketing plans, when we're planning commercial strategies, when we're planning what we're doing from the pipeline. We have to have those people in the room because they understand it. It's not antiseptic. You know, we discover, we develop, we manufacture, we sell and market drugs. Yes, we understand that. But there's so much more to this ecosystem in our space. And understanding the diverse patients is really, really critical. And so from my vantage point, when I can't appeal to a person's heart, I appeal to their mind and I appeal to their pocketbooks, their bottom line. And that's what a lot of times gets people to understand diversity and inclusion in my industry. Hey, good looking. Are you currently getting paid to speak? Would you like to ramp that up? We can help. Book a confidential speaker strategy call with our team at doitmarketing.com slash call, and let's see what we might do together. The call is free, but the results may be priceless. It's very, very interesting because what you're really talking about is the marketing and packaging of ideas, Mm -hmm. right? Just like we market and package and promote and sell drugs, Sometimes you got to market, package, promote, and sell these ideas to the various stakeholders. How large is your team? How many folks are in that diversity and inclusion center of excellence? Only nine people. Wow. How about that? So those are really- We have four diversity ambassador teams that are external to the COE within the organization around the globe that help us to drive the strategy. They must be doing some of the work on the ground, so to speak. Are they teaching classes? Are they- doing presentations? Are they serving as a resource locally? What's the job description of an ambassador? There's four diversity ambassador teams and they all focus in different swim lanes. One are GDNI business consortium. Those are business leaders who through their day jobs, they have to do it through a lens of diversity and inclusion. So for example, in our clinical operations and our patient innovation group, they have to sometimes get patients through our clinical trials, diverse patients. And so we have to make sure that when we are developing our products and our services and our medicines, that it works for all patients of all different backgrounds. And so having diverse patients in our clinical trials is one thing that's very, very important. That's one of the focuses. Health literacy making sure that everyone understands what they need to be doing when they get the medication. So that's not always apparent to the layperson. Supplier diversity. So those are examples of individuals that are on the GDNI business consortium. So they're doing their jobs. They have to do it through a lens of diversity and inclusion. They're presenting both internally and externally. They're developing standard operating procedures and practices and protocols that integrate diversity and inclusion into them. They're developing multi-dimensional marketing strategies to make sure that marketing strategies appeal to the various different patients and the people and the physicians around the globe. 
So that's on the business side. We also have the Employee Business Resource Group Executive Leadership Council. We have 10 employee business resource groups, or some companies call them affinity groups. And it's comprised of 10 different constituency groups, and they are helping to drive it in the local communities with their local chapters. They're driving talent management, lunch and learns, building capabilities of our diverse employees. So that is another swim lane, focusing on the grassroots. The third group is representatives of our HR team. So we call it the GD&I Extended HR Leadership Team. And they're responsible for making sure all of our people strategies, that it's done through a lens of diversity and inclusion. And one would think that our HR colleagues, that they intrinsically get it. And most of them do. But we want to make sure that anything that's going out into our employees, our benefit strategies, our management strategies, all learning and development, talent management strategies, that they're first being looked at by this group to make sure that it is encompassing the viewpoints, the thoughts, the ideals of all of our diverse employees. So making sure that it's going to have that optimal effect. And then our fourth diversity ambassador team is our Disability Inclusion Strategy Council. This group is comprised of various different leaders, facilities management, IT, compliance, learning and development, health and well-being, and they're basically responsible for an integrated disability inclusion strategy. People always ask me, like, well, why is that your fourth diversity ambassador team? Why a focus on disabilities? And I say that if we can create an inclusive environment for persons with disabilities in every different spectrum, then we can create an inclusive environment for everyone. A lot of people don't understand the role when we create things for persons with disabilities. Give you a perfect example, Siri on your phone. That was originally created for someone with a visual disability. So that type of thinking, that idea is now something that all of us benefit, whether we have a disability or not, on our phones. And so these are some of the things where I always say that if we can create an environment where it's inclusive of everyone, regardless of their ability, and we try to focus on what they can do, not what they can't do. But if we can create that environment, that benefits everyone, regardless of your background, your ability or not. So those are the four, I call them diversity ambassador teams that work with us. And that comprises the teams around 70 to 75 people. But when we think of our employee business resource groups or those affinity teams, the membership is close to between 15 to 17,000 members in those 10 groups. So we're creating a, a groundswell. I call it an employee awakening. Employees are really grasping hold of diversity and inclusion ideals because they want an inclusive culture. They want to feel valued. They don't want to feel marginalized when they come to work. And engaged an empowered and energized employee is what we want. Yeah, boy, that's totally fantastic. I'm curious, those 16, 17,000 folks that stepped up to join the groups, do they have meetings? Is there an online community where they can connect? How are they fostering the membership in those 10 organizations? They have regular meetings. They also have virtual meetings because they're global in nature. So for example, our women's network has over 9,000 members. They're in all areas, almost all of the countries that we do business in. And so they meet regularly. The leadership team meets regularly. The chapters meet regularly. And they do it virtually like this, webcasting, WebExes, all of our laptops at Merck, they're all equipped with webcams. And so we can talk to each other face-to-face. -face. They meet live, of course. They sponsor different events. They sponsor different activities as well, not just within Merck, but in the communities that they are a part of as well. Let me ask you the next question, which is, I know this is a continual thorn in the side of almost every diversity and inclusion executive. Let's say it's mission accomplished and all the frontline folks, all the recruiting, all the initial HR processes, all of the hiring totally dialed in. We've got a diverse entry level workforce. Now becomes the question, and you know, we've all been in these meetings where it's like, hey, it's time to you know, pick a new senior leader, or it's time for, you know, to fill a board position, or it's time to fill a very high visibility. Who do we got? And look around the room, and it's all the old white guys again. <laughs> so as we're looking at talent development, and we're looking at who gets raised, praised, and promoted, 
I know it's not something that you've solved and there's a magic bullet, magic beans. How do we do better when we're looking at who gets raised, praised, and promoted so that that wonderful initiative and all of that grassroots effort now starts to flow up the organization and we're not just looking at level one, but we're looking at level two and three and seven and 17 and we're seeing a very inclusive group of humans at every level of the company. Well, uh, there's an old adage that says you measure what's important. We measure financial reporting, we measure shareholder value, we measure revenues, we measure all of those different things that drive an organization. And so we measure people as well. And not so much to say we have a quota, but it's basically based on what's available externally in the labor market and internally in your internal labor market. What's available? What percentage of of women, of persons of color are available in the feeder pool, and that's what you should look like. So using that same logic, we basically say, okay, if you have 50% at your director level, well, your executive director level in those promotions should reflect that feeder pool at 50%. And so that's basically kind of the logic that we use, and we measure it in every part of our business to make sure. And it looks different depending on whether it be the commercial side of the business or the manufacturing side of the business or the research side of the business or IT, whatever it is. But we have to make sure that we're looking at diversifying our workforce and what is relevant at that local market and what's relevant for that area of the organization. And so each of the different areas looks at their information, looks at their representation, and then says, what their vision or what their goal should be, their aspirational goal should be. And that's where they prioritize. Yeah, no, that's really, really key. I love that. What a great episode. Wowza. Tell you what, if you want to ramp up your revenue as an expert who speaks professionally, you should really check out our free online training at doitmarketing.com slash webinar. Let me ask you also another sort of hot button issue or question that always comes up is about bias, right? Mm -hmm. Bias, conscious bias, unconscious bias. It's sometimes we're just wired. So when you said, hey, let's look at things through a lens of diversity, initially we got to take the lens of bias off or we have to at least acknowledge or compensate or put corrective glasses onto our bias lens, even by acknowledging it. So for example, I work with a great diversity and inclusion speaker named Susan McCustion. And in her speech, she says, hey, we're all biased. Get over it. Let's move on from here. Now that we all know that we're all biased, now we can do something about it. Now we can start to put some things in place. How do you handle, because I know it's also a hot button, kind of a dangerous word sometimes, and people are afraid of this concept. How do you acknowledge, how do you account for it? How do you start to diffuse it when we're talking about bias, conscious or unconscious? I think that's right. The first thing is everybody has biases. So it's basically trying to uncover what those unconscious biases are, right? Back in, oh gosh, it's been 2014, we had all of our senior leaders, vice presidents, go through unconscious bias training, mandatory. We said we want everybody to go through a two-hour training, and it was a good introduction and awareness of our own biases and how it can impact how you make decisions in the workplace. And so that was good. We also said, you know what? We've done it at the vice president level. Let's now introduce it at the higher managerial levels as well. Plant managers and manufacturing sites, research lab leaders. Again, a great, oh, uh aha, this is really interesting, right? But then when you leave the training room and then go out to whether that be the plant floor or the conference room, or wherever it is that you go and you manage and you lead people, then it's sort of like it didn't transfer as well as we wanted it to. And so then it became, how do you take unconscious bias and then make sure that it's not causing actions that is going to have disparate treatment versus one group of people versus another? And so what we started to do then was introduce it sort of just-in-time learning. For example, a hiring manager, they have an opening and they have to start the hiring process. Well, what we did was we created 
very short, less than five minute little video vignettes that really specifically talk about unconscious bias in the hiring process or unconscious bias in the talent management process or unconscious bias in the pay decision process. So we created these little vignettes. And for example, when a hiring manager hosts a job, automatically this video comes up and it basically helps them to see, well, you know, you're getting ready to start this process manager. There can be unconscious bias in the hiring process. and We want to make you aware of it. And so you don't do this as you're going through this process. And it's very short. It doesn't infringe a lot on their time. And it's just in time learning, which really, really helps to get their minds into it. When we're getting ready to do talent review discussions, when we're getting ready to start succession planning discussions, the leader in the room will play the five-minute video before they even get started. The leaders get started with the succession planning discussion around unconscious bias in the succession planning process. And it's shown at the very beginning because it's front of mind. And throughout the meeting, you find people sort of calling people out on it. So it was just in time, very short, but very, very impactful in the moment learning. Because that's when we as adults, when it's most impactful to us. But the thing about unconscious biases, you have to be careful from the standpoint of this is something that we grew up with, right? We learned this in the household, in our communities our parents, et cetera. And so making sure that people understand that you have to be careful when you're talking about it because you don't want to attack how someone was brought up. You know, you just, you don't do that. And you have to treat people with dignity and respect and around their upbringing. And sometimes these things are so personal. And so when you talk about unconscious bias, you have to really talk about it from the standpoint of, yes, we all have biases. But when you bring those biases, whatever they are, you have to make yourself aware of them. But when it starts to impact how you're making decisions about people in the workplace on your team, then that's where you need to really just check yourself and make sure that it's not going to impact someone in a disparate way. Right. Absolutely. Well, and of course, you know, bias has so many different sources. So if I'm 25 pounds overweight and I see this person come in who's like just rail thin and super fit, I'm like, ah, you know, yeah, I'm not sure about this. Mm-hmm. If I see someone come in with a, a big, beautiful, full head of hair, I'm like, well, he's not in the handsome bald man club. I'm not going to like working with him. <laughs> it comes from all sorts of sources, Absolutely right? Absolutely does. You know, you'd be shocked at some of the stories that some folks have told me about their biases and where they come from. And some of it is hilarious. It's absolutely hilarious. When I sit there and I look at someone and I think, oh, you know, and I know that I have a bias from that perspective and I make sure that I check myself in the moment. Now, Celeste, you mentioned that you moved to this five minute just in time learning modules. The initial training that didn't really quite stick, was that live in person? Yes, it was. The initial and that was internally was. delivered, or did you like outsource to it was, a company it was, for uh, that? We, we leveraged an external consulting yeah. group to come in and, and train all the vice presidents. It was really good engagement in the room. They were excellent facilitators and great engagement in the room and big ahas and wow, you know, I didn't realize it about myself and everything. So some of it did take, but for the most part, you know, you look at the numbers, right? And you look at, that's how you determine whether something is successful. And we weren't making a lot of headway. It wasn't until we started really, I call kneading the dough and getting it at those moments that matter is when we started to see some uptick. Now, I want to talk because this brings up a great point with the just-in-time learning. Any learning, no matter how wonderful and impactful, once is not enough, right? We need some ongoing sources of repetition, reinforcement, and ideally on-the-job, in-context application. Otherwise, those skills atrophy if you never end up using them. And I love the five-minute just-in-time tied to functional activities, Mm -hmm. right? Above and beyond that, what are some other sources that you offered to your folks of ongoing repetition, reinforcement, application, on the job, in the real world, so that this becomes a permanent capability and competency in each employee. So we have a lot of e-learning. So anyone can go online and get any of our diversity and inclusion capability building e-learning. There's a lot of different things we do. We offer it from the standpoint of however you want to deliver it, whether it's I want to just sit down with my computer and I want to engage that way, 
or I'm a people manager and I want to introduce it at a staff meeting and we're going to take an hour and we're going to discuss it at a staff meeting or peer-to-peer engagement as well. But it's got to be done in the moment. It's got to be done through constant engagement at meetings basically in real world settings. Yes, it's got to be in real world settings to reinforce it. What we're finding over the last couple of years is that leaders are challenging each other. And so you don't need necessarily an HR person in the room. You don't necessarily need a diversity person in the room or even one of the diversity ambassadors. We're changing the dialogue around diversity and inclusion. You know, some of my HR colleagues, they'll come in and they'll say, Celeste, you know, I was facilitating a meeting, but I didn't even have to say anything. This manager said this and this manager said that, and they challenged each other. And that's where you know you're making headway, when you can sit back as the leader, the functional leader in this space, and basically watch others learn from each other and key off of each other in the moment while you're talking about it. Like For example, there was a marketing leader. He's sitting in a room And he's a a person of color, African-American, and they're talking about a strategy for how they want to approach a certain community. They're saying, well, you know, maybe we should really strike up a partnership with the fitness center or this or that. And he said, you know, he goes, have you guys ever been in black communities? There's not a lot of fitness centers. You need to go in and engage and understand. And that's kind of what the point that he was making was we need to go in, engage and understand. You can't interpret what you think people of a various different background or culture or experience might be. You have to talk with them. You have to engage with them. You have to go walk a mile in their shoes, for example. That's how you understand and meet people where they are to basically be able to have those very hard challenging at times, bold and courageous conversations around inclusion, because that's what we're talking about. We got to get away from the she versus he, we versus them. We got to get away from that and engage in a conversation where we're treating everyone with dignity and respect, but we're engaging in those hard conversations. Yes, I know I'm different from you. You're different from me, but let's talk about where those differences are, but then also talk about where we can come together to help drive our business and drive this discussion or whatever the outcome is. Those conversations are not easy, but we have to have them if we're going to truly have the inclusive environment that we want. Yeah. Well, last couple of questions. This has been so fantastic. And thank you again for hopping on with us. Tell us a little bit about the role of internal thought leadership, not so much the training and the just in time, Mm -hmm. but when you look in an industry or even you look at the Fortune 500, Merck wants to be top of the pack, right? Mm -hmm. Publicly, privately, internally, externally, in small, medium, and large ways. How are you sharing this thought leadership of all these great ideas? And even how are the ambassadors on some level sharing a thought leadership position around doing business differently through all of these mechanisms to help with diversity and inclusion? Well, first, we have sort of an umbrella. Here's enterprise-wide. Here's what Merck values from a diversity and inclusion standpoint. So we talk about that overall because we want to make sure that that is very clear around our stance around diversity and inclusion. So every ambassador, everyone that speaks understands what we value, how we approach it. And so we make sure that everybody understands that. I call it the umbrella. And then they talk specifically about what it means and what's the relevance in that particular country, in that region, in that area of the business. And so they can put their own spin on it. So there's a difference in, I always say, you're presenting and you're going to also present this. You're going to speak about this as well. So it's active listening and then asking questions in the dialogue. And then they go out and they say, this is what Merck stands for when it comes to DNI. Here's what our link to that is, making it relevant to the people wherever they are and wherever they sit around the globe. And so we teach people to be speakers, voicing what our stance is around diversity and inclusion. That's really what's important because I can't be in 120 different countries where we do business. My nine folks can't be in 120 different countries. So we leverage technology. We leverage all employee town halls. We leverage regional and national meetings. So we just try to really just reach out to the masses as best we can. I can't tell you how important technology is. 
it's just really, really critical. We're in a digital age. We have to be able to make sure that we can approach and hit those 69,000 employees as best we can and making everyone an ambassador for diversity eventually. I love that. I think that's a beautiful place to end right there with that vision, that picture in our minds. So Celeste, thank you for being with us. If people were to take one central idea that they might want to adopt in their corporation and their company, even in their department, even if they're not in a DNI function. What one key concept do you hope people might take away from our conversation? I think that people need to understand that diversity and inclusion, it's not an abstract concept. It's not something nebulous that's in the air. It is a strategic driver of business. And I believe that at that intersection of diversity and inclusion and business performance, you create a competitive advantage for the company because you create an environment for your employees where they can feel energized, engaged, and very importantly, empowered to innovate, to be able to drive the business. And that's what you want to create, an inclusive culture. Love it. Diversity and inclusion as a driver of business results. That's it. Awesome. Celeste, thank you again. We have to have you back. I mean, we could have gone on for three hours. I know you're super busy, so we don't have three hours, but we definitely have to continue the conversation in a future episode. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I really enjoyed this. It was great talking with you. Well, that wraps up another episode of The Speaking Show. Hey, tell you what, if you like us, rate us and review us on iTunes. Subscribe. Tell a friend. Go grab the notes and downloads and extras at thespeakingshow.com. See you next time. 